Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for what promises to be a riveting and insightful conversation centered around data privacy and protection. By the numbers, uh, I can tell that this is of interest to, to, to many of you, um, just from the number of people that have already joined, and some people are still filtering through, but hopefully by the time we've gotten through introducing the panelists and just talking about um, the focus areas for this webinar this morning, um, everyone would have been, been, been um, filtered in. My name is Andre Palmer. I am the Director of Research and Engagement here at Simtai Consulting, and I am joined by an esteemed panel of thought leaders and experts in the data privacy and protection space. I'll introduce them all in a, in a little bit. But the, the, the goal of this conversation today um, is really a dissection of data protection in, in such a way that, that you start to see it as more than just a compliance requirement, but as a necessary and useful part of your everyday business processes. And secondly, we want to be able to map a very clear process or roadmap to support your compliance efforts with the various data protection regulations. So essentially, what, what, what are we unmasking in this conversation? We'd love to have a look at the, some of the misconceptions of the impact of the, data, of the data protection regulations and what is required for organizations to become compliant. And secondly, we want to have a complete look at the data protection lifecycle and how each part, the legal, the technical, and the governance components all play together to form an ongoing privacy and protection program. So let's quickly talk about who we have on the uh, the panel this morning. We have Andrew Nooks, who is the, direct, the, the Director of Efficiency for Growth at Simtai Consulting. And you can see he has a whole alphabet behind his name. I won't necessarily go into what all of these things mean. Uh, also joining Andrew is Grace, Le uh, Grace Lindo, who is a partner at uh, Lindo Carter, or Carter Lindo, um, one of the, the principals at uh, Carter Lindo. We have Stuart Hilton, who is a senior manager in the IT compliance and data privacy business unit here at Simtai Consulting. Alicia Perez is a director of transformation, assurance, and compliance at Simtai. And Jason Cronk. Uh, he is an author, he is a privacy professional, uh, privacy expert, um, and what we're calling a uh, privacy guru in, in, in totality. So I'm really excited to have the, um, really excited to have this, this panel joining us this morning for what promises to be a really great conversation. So um, Andrew, let, let's start with you. You know, we have this very um, almost scary sounding title unmasking the monster. What exactly are we talking about um, when, when we talk about unmasking the data privacy protection monster? Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're hearing me clearly. Uh, I don't know. I, I grew up in the era of, of um, Scooby-Doo, you know, and when you look at um, Scooby and Shaggy, they're always um, going along this path of mystery, trying to figure out who they the so-called ghost is or who the monster is in, in, in their um, film. But typically, when it really comes down to it, when they start putting the different pieces of clues together, they undoubtedly realize that this monster, this big old scary creature that they may see um, is nothing but just um, you know, somebody who is trying to, to, to scare them off for, for, for some kind of a gain or something. Or if you look at Pirates of the Caribbean and you see the Kraken in Pirates of the Caribbean that has a multitude of teeth, you know, you look at that monster and you're like, boy, you know, if those teeth get into me, what it would do to me? But when, you, when it comes down to it, Andre and, 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 and viewers, if we understand what it is that we're up against, right? If we, if we, we, if we are not fearful of what is out there, then we'd be a step ahead of the game. And to reduce that fear is to educate ourselves, to inform ourselves, to know what's about. So zeroing in on the, on the data protection um, laws across the globe, it comes with understanding what is required of you. 
And if you understand what is required of you, then you don't have to fear the teeth. You don't have to fear the ghost. You don't have to fear the monster. Because you can take baby steps. You can, you can start um, demystifying everything to do with the monster and putting things in place. So you won't be afraid of fines and, and, and everything else. As a matter of fact, if you can tame the mo monster, you can use that monster um, and, and those methodologies to your own advantage. So that's why, I mean, in, in, in going through this for the last couple of years, you know, we've seen a lot of persons um, getting very fearful because they hear about fines and, and, you know, persons are out there telling them, boy, this is so scary. But if you take the time to know what it is, then it won't be that scary. And the law goes a far way in outlining what is necessary. And if we follow those steps, and if we take advantage of what we already know from project management to cybersecurity to, to, to legal and compliance um, to your technical controls, if you, if you pull all of those things together, what you already know, then it would be much easier to unmask this monster and have this monster become a nice cuddly teddy bear as you, as you um, roll out your program. So if, if, I, if I could summarize what you've just said, by the time we get to the end of this conversation, we will realize that the monster behind the mask is nothing but a teddy bear, nothing to be, nothing to be, to be feared. I like that. Let, let's go back to the beginning, though. Um, over the last five years or so, data privacy and protection have become really important, very topical across the globe. Um, and I'd love for Jason to weigh in just a little bit to talk about why data privacy protection have become so important over the last five years. Thanks, uh, Ray, and thanks uh, everybody for having me. Um, you know, privacy is nothing new. Uh, you know, we've had a concept of privacy as humans for hundreds or thousands of years ever since, you know, we started arranging ourselves in uh, larger, larger social groups. Uh, what's happened in the last 50 years is that information systems uh, the interconnection of those information systems, i.e. the internet, uh, and just the globalization of data and personal data and data about ourselves has really created a, a commodification of data. Uh, and in fact, by proxy, a commodification of people. And, and people tend to, to not like that. It is one thing when you know you go into your local restaurant and your server knows you like uh, jackfruit tacos, uh, but it is completely a, a different thing when you're getting random emails from companies you've never heard of who are offering you coupons on uh, jackfruit tacos, uh, and people don't like that. They don't like that sense of uh, of you know this world knowing about them and and even things that they may not know about themselves, uh, but the companies are able to figure out uh, quicker. Unfortunately, they're in a position where they feel powerless uh, and are unable to overcome that. And uh, you know companies are in a in a position to exert that power, and they have the individuals have limited choices potentially uh, in the market. So what has happened in the last five years, and, and you might say even longer, certainly in, in Europe, is a re realization by governments of this power imbalance uh, between the organizations which have an incentive to collect and monetize data and individuals who feel powerless to, to do anything about them. Uh, and, and so those government, that government realization had led to laws and regulations trying to right that imbalance uh, and, and put the power back in the hands of individuals uh, and, and restrict the uh, potential of organizations to take advantage uh, of that uh, power imbalance. Yeah, no, great context uh, there, Jason. So, so based on all that that's happened and based on that context that you've painted, what would you say is the current state of data protection across the globe? What's that looking like? I mean, a lot of people are familiar with GDPR, um, but in addition to GDPR, what are some of the other changes that we've seen? Well, again, they were Europeans were on the forefront for a number of historical reasons, uh, but now a lot of the countries are catching up. Uh, and there's an accelerated pace uh, of countries who are uh, who, who are enacting data protection legislation. Um, you have China, Brazil, Saudi Arabia 
even uh, got a new data protection law. Um, the United States is, is uh, still struggling along because our political infrastructure doesn't make it at the federal level uh, very uh, appetizing, but certainly uh, there is a, uh, a chorus of states who are enacting uh, data protection laws or, or privacy laws in general. Uh, it does tend to be, uh, there's also, you know, one of the things that people don't realize is there are a lot of laws that have implications uh, around privacy and data protection that are not uh, that are not labeled as privacy laws. Uh, I run uh, an organization called the Institute of Operational Privacy by Design or Privacy Design, and we have a wiki around privacy. Now it's it's sort of U.S. focused, but we have over 400 U.S. state laws in that. Uh, database uh, that have privacy implications, uh, even though they may not be deemed uh, privacy law. So, so there, there is history. There is just the problem is uh, up until the last five years, there hasn't been uh, across the globe this you know desire for comprehensive laws. But that now is is changing uh, given the situation, uh, like I said, around personal data and the the globalization and and uh, increasing pace of commodification. Awesome. And, and as you were talking there, um, Jason, I saw Grace nodding vigorously in agreement. Um, and I think it is because she also knows that, you know, whenever things like these happen outside of our region, there are implications for the Caribbean as a region as well. Um, so, so, Grace, I'd love to kick it to you. Um, what would you say that all of these things mean for, for us as a region? And what are some of the implications that we are now seeing? For us as a region. Eh? Well, thank you very much, Simtai. First, let me just say thank you for having me this morning and for uh, having me on such an esteemed panel. I'm really learning as I go along. Uh, so, the implications are quite numerous right here in us in the Caribbean. Uh, you know, it opens us up as a business center. Certainly, it makes people more comfortable in terms of doing business here. You know, we're, we're, we're islands, yes, but we don't stand alone. There are lots of times when we have to reach out to service providers overseas, whether it is cloud service providers or otherwise, platform as a service is becoming a very big thing as people build out their services in the Caribbean. And so it makes us more comfortable with even doing business with overseas entities. We, uh, you know, it, it serves a double role because not only do we have to be um, compliant, but we also learn their language. And I think that's one of the things that I really have learned about and loved about this area of the law and this sector is the increase in knowledge in terms of knowing the language which is spoken in other jurisdictions, whether it is related to data sovereignty, or just platform related issues, authentication, um, you know, multi-factor authentication, for instance, that's something which the tech guys can tell you all about when it comes to cybersecurity. So the implications for us, uh, I think there are no boundaries really, and it's something that we should embrace while at the same time knowing the rules and knowing where it is that we need to stop and make sure that we are on the side of the regulations as they develop. You know, you that means that no, no, go on. Go, go, ahead. go ahead. All right. That being said, um, there was something that Jason said, which I really wanted to segue from, where he said that he has built a matrix. He didn't use that explicit word, but certainly a matrix in respect of other data privacy laws, which he has seen just practicing in the area. And that's something that we're seeing in Jamaica, too. Uh, people tend to think, well, it's just the Jamaica Data Protection Act, which should come into force in a few months. So that's the only piece of statutes or piece of legislation that I need to look at. And no, that's not the case. We're seeing where even our local parliament in promulgating recent laws, um, the Trust um, and Corporate Sub Provider Services Act, which just came out, for instance, they are now requiring the regulated entities to make sure that they implement data protection principles, best practices. And it's very broad in respect of what those best practices are. And so they really require like, regulated entities to look back to the Data Protection Act, yes. But what that may mean is that if you are in a regulated sector, uh, regulated sector, your regulator may be looking at more than just how your financial are, whether you're fit and proper, but they may start to look at your privacy policies as well, and whether you are really helping your customers, whether you are, um, you know, using international best practices, certainly before that comes into force in relation to privacy. 
And I don't see that trend waning at any time. I see us becoming more and more conscious of privacy rules. The needs regulations are going to be tabled today. So we're going to see how, you know, that brings privacy to the fore in a very real manner for us here in Jamaica. And it's an exciting time, but it's also a time for us to buckle up our shoes and shoes and make sure that we are on the right path. Great. You, you touched on so many things that I, I kind of want to dig into, and I'll come back to some of them in a little bit, um, especially some of the um, the more nuanced legal considerations as well. Well, before I do that, though, I'd love to, to hear Stuart's um, perspective on what the state of privacy looks like across the region. I mean, I, we focus quite a bit on the Jamaica Data Protection Act, because that is the one that is kind of impending. Um, but, but Stuart, perhaps you could just tell us um, very briefly what other Caribbean territories are doing or have done in respect to um, data protection. Andre, thanks and good morning, everyone. Uh, so, you know, as, as Andre alluded to, the Caribbean is not any different from the rest of the world in terms of making sure that we meet these, this call to action around data protection and, and, and adequately protecting the privacy of citizens around the Caribbean. So, of course, Jamaica is on the forefront right now for, 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 for getting up and running with our Data Protection Act uh, by November 30th, which is the deadline for us to register as data controllers. But we've already seen legislations passed and being enforced around the Caribbean, such as Cayman. Their legislation has been passed and is enforced, and they have what is called the ombudsman, who is very active in the space. If, if, you, if you follow the activities in Cayman, you'll see regular reporting around privacy uh, privacy and protection uh, infractions or notices that are happening in, in Cayman. Uh, Bahamas, their legislation has been enforced, I believe, uh, I, I may be corrected, but I believe since about 2013. Uh, you know, Trinidad has passed parts of a legislation but is not fully enforced. Barbados has their legislation which went into, which became enforced as of 2021 and their information commission is there. And you know, it goes on and on. Uh, the, the OECS or the Eastern Caribbean uh, territories, uh, they have had legislations passed in different islands, but are actually in the process now of harmonizing their legislation so that those eight member territories have a more, uh, as the word says, harmonized uh, requirement across the region. And we even see Cuba has, you know, up to last year tabled their own data protection legislation. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's here. It's growing, it's going to continue to grow. Uh, other islands, you know, in the Dutch, French, um, other Antilles have had, you know, requirements under GDPR to enforce as well, you know, um, so, and, and at different levels. But the idea is that, you know, we, we are not alone in this journey and you're going to see continue to grow. Uh, probably changes will happen as we become more, more mature, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to go away anytime soon and we're going to have to find ways to meet those requirements, not just on a local level, but across the board. Great, thank you, Stuart. Um, and as you were talking, uh, Stephen Williams, um, who is from Barbados, has been typing in the chat. And one of the things that he says is that he's been involved in data protection for a while in Barbados. They have an act that's been passed, as you've said, um, and a data commissioner uh, has been appointed. But there are some concerns, um, enforcement concerns relating to autonomy of the data commissioner especially when it comes to having uh having to regulate the activities of other government agencies um and i guess we'll get into those some of those conversations a little bit later when we talk about our own office of the information um commissioner um thank you very much for sharing the perspective from the bar the barbados um, example there um stephen no, okay, so and one of the things that you said, or, or one of the points that you ended on, Stuart, is this idea that data protection is here. We see how it's sweeping across the region. We see other places starting to take it really seriously. So it's here to stay, it's not going anywhere. I mean, when we just started this conversation a few years ago, people felt like because data is the new gold or the new oil, um, regulating the space is going to be difficult and it was something that was going to be a nine day wonder. But we're now seeing that this is something that is that is going to be part of our um, business practices moving forward. So I'd like to to ask a question. We have a, a, almost 300 people um, on this webinar today. Um, we'd like to throw up the, for, the first poll question just to get a reading on your what you think the level of knowledge is within your organization. Um, so the first question goes up, um, just a poll, yes or no. Um, and that should be going up in a minute, no. 
And the question really is whether or not you believe uh, that your organization has a good understanding of data protection. And while, while you're responding to that, um, I'd like to bring Grace back in um, because a lot of the things that she talked about, you know, were, were around some of the legal implications. And interestingly, Grace, when we speak to a lot of clients, they automatically think that this is a legal exercise. When they hear data privacy, when they hear data protection, the first place they go to is the legal aspect of it. Do you think that legal consultation by itself is sufficient to get organization on board with what is expected and required of them? Okay. Well, you know, Andre, I'm, I wouldn't fault them entirely. You know, it does come from a piece of, of legislation. And so I can see where they would head to a lawyer first. But I know it, certainly in the implementation phase that we have been involved in, it involves quite a bit of technical areas in which, um, you know, project management skills are required. It involves technical skills regarding knowledge of cybersecurity protocols. Uh, you know, what I say all the time to my clients is, well, I will look at this very briefly for you, but really someone who is very versed in cybersecurity really needs to know what protocol, what sort of testing is done, penetration testing or otherwise is done in respect of your system, uh, you know, because that's, essentially the organizational and technical methods which are required under the act for you to ensure that your systems are as up-to-date as possible. So it does require some amount of technical insight. For me, in respect of implementation, the first point of, of, of the first, uh, you know, part of what which we start our journey is data mapping and knowing where your data is. We cannot start to advise you unless we know what you have and what has gone wrong. And for me, I find that to be quite technical. That's why you know you have firms such as Simtai to assist in data mapping, data auditing, to map where the data is so that you can find out what you have that you do not even know about. And once that's done, well, legal can come in. And of course, we depend on persons who are project managers. And I know Simtai does have that sort of expertise in respect of the governance aspect of the program. So it is something that we work hand in hand with uh, technical insight, technical teams. And we've seen that, you know, being required under you know, quite a few circumstances. It works best for the clients in the long run, for the organization in the long run, because you're getting the best of the both worlds. And certainly in terms of a long, longer, you know, sort of relationship, I think knowing that you have both sorts of expertise behind you and, and backing you up just makes it much more comfortable going forward post November 30, 2023, of course. Great. Um, and Jason, I'd love to hear your perspective. So in working with um, with clients all over the world, what would you say has been um, a common theme in terms of a general starting point when organizations are considering their legal obligations under various regulations? Well, you know, as, I, as I mentioned, there, there's hundreds of laws. And, and now, obviously, depending on the size and, and breadth of your organization in terms of its you know, international footprint, uh, a lot of the companies I work with do have significant international footprints. Uh, and I, I tend to counsel. Now, I, I, I play two roles. I am an attorney here in the U.S., uh, but I also have a non-legal consulting business around privacy. And, and I would say for the vast majority of my clients, looking at privacy in a non-legal capacity is, is probably most helpful because it, it's, it's almost impossible to, to comply with every law and every jurisdiction you may have a connection to. Uh, just the, the nuances and trying to understand it is, is a, an incredibly difficult task. So trying to develop a baseline privacy program and do the things that are very common, not looking at specific laws, but are very common uh, across uh, the, the legal landscape uh, is extremely important. So seeing if you have those, those common situations, obviously data security is, is kind of a, a no-brainer. Um, 
but then things like things you know around uh, rights, uh, data subject rights or individual rights of accessing, telling them what they you know what you have, giving them uh, any choices uh, that you can uh, reasonably give them. Um, you know, and so there's a lot of programmatic elements, uh, and and what you, Sentai, uh, a couple of you have referred to as as governance, and having uh, that as a as a baseline, I think is extremely important. So making sure you have staff that are adequately knowledgeable, and they don't have to be experts, but they have to know enough to know that they don't know, and then seek out experts um, or, or get trained internally uh, and therefore operate uh, in that way. But just having that baseline, what I always say is, you know, having that, that governance baseline, you're going you're gonna to get 90% of the laws in 90% of the jurisdictions. And then it's a matter of looking at specific nuances. Um, and I don't know if there's anything in the Jama Jamaican Data Protection uh, Act, but like California, for instance, you have to have a do not sell link. That's not something you're gonna find in any other law, but it's, it's kind of one of those idiosyncrasies you may need to know about if you're, if you're operating in California. But again, very similar across the board. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, of similarities in laws and just having that baseline privacy program, is, I think is extremely important. One, one of the key bits that you talked about in establishing that baseline privacy program is this idea of governance. Um, and Alicia, uh, I see, uh, you know, she was, she was nodding. She was nodding in agreement vigorously because now you're kind of, you know, talking her language. Um, so Alicia, I'd love to bring you into this conversation. Um, from a governance perspective, one of the questions that we get a lot is where should the privacy program reside? Um, what are your thoughts on it? Because again, you know, we, we often hear there's no one right or wrong answer, but from a governance perspective, in terms of ownership, of that baseline privacy program that Jason talked about, where, where do we see that residing typically within the organization? Thank you so much, Andre. And absolutely just loved where, where Jason landed a while ago, speaking around, you know, it's, it's not data privacy and protection as this isolated requirement. But if you really think about it is, had we as organization practiced good data governance from get-go, we would have a big part of what is required under our data privacy and protection laws that are being enforced you now. And then it being a bit of a tweaking for what the different uh, jurisdictions have specifically, you know, the, the nuances as, as you spoke of. And, and, and specifically to your question, um, Andre, around data governance and what is important. And, and Jason alluded to it a while ago, ensuring that persons are aware of what is required, that we do the data that's going through our organizations, that we can have appreciation for the sensitivity of that, the sensitivity of that information that's going through, the mechanisms that are in place that are protecting that information through this data life cycle. And I went back to the initial point around having had good information management practices, a lot of this would have been built out already. Um, we would know where the data is coming from, how is it being stored, what are our reporting, reporting um, requirements, how we're reporting or using the data to drive reports within the organization, and how are we interacting with this information, even as we try to drive our business processes, whether it is sending to customers, etc. So governance plays a huge role um, in, in terms of ensuring that we're ready. That are requirements of our data privacy and protection um, laws and, and, and regulation. And a lot of it comes back with organizations being very, very clear around rules and responsibilities that we have a structure in place. And I think one of the, the areas, Andre, where we, we tend to have data around well, is it a is it a compliance activity? Or right, yes. Activity? It's important to say it's just like anything else that we've been doing for the last 150 years or however long your organization has been in place. There's a frontline set of activities where people are actively collecting information, etc. And you must still have your second line of defense, or we don't call it second line of defense anymore, but you also must have your compliance law um, um, that is independent of frontline activities that ensure that our, our, our protection activities are robust and sufficient to meet 
the, the requirements of the legislation. So very, very similar to a lot of the things that we've done in the past. We still still need all three lines. Uh, and if you had to distill all of that down to maybe three critical functions of a data governance program, Alicia, what would you say those things are? One, a very clear um, charter in terms of roles and responsibility. Who is responsible for what? Yeah. To answer that question, and I don't get too panicked around, you know, should it lie with my data function or should it lie? Find a, find a place where it's going to sit, where it's going to um, sit seamlessly within your organization in terms of how data is actually being actively managed for you today. Um, the, the, the skill sets that you have, there's quite a bit of latitude there. Um, the second part is that there is a robust enough compliance function. There's someone who must have oversight responsibilities for how data is being managed, the extent to which we are compliant, um, and provide guidance to the frontline support as well. So very, very clear chart of rules and responsibilities. I think the second big thing which, which goes um, alongside that very clearly is awareness and ensuring that all persons across the organization are aware of their responsibilities as, as data holders, custodians, the, the various roles that they play, that, that is clear. Um, not very dissimilar, but I like to keep pulling it back the things that we've done in the past because the, the intent of this webinar is to not make it as clear. Do you remember when we had cyber security and this whole security awareness was a big thing? Very similar to that. Everybody who is playing on this team needs to be aware of what their role is. And just like anything else, if I'm fully prepared, if I'm trained, I'm going to be a bit better able to execute my function. And it's less likely or unwittingly, the more um, simple mistakes. Then the, the third piece that I think um, Andre is very important is to agree on what kind of tooling. Uh, we're going to need as an organization to meet all the requirements that are in place. We're we'll trying to know that. And I, I think it's going to be a little different for us on this time than it is in the north. But the maturity of our EPS data management or data governance practices, we're coming up the curve on this side of the region. We see a lot of companies you now putting effort into structuring, putting a proper data governance framework around what, what we've been doing with our data. So for those who are still coming up the learning curve, they being clear on the tool sets that we need to ensure that we can seamlessly meet the requirements of, of, of the legislation is also another big part because anything that is too difficult to consistently. Yeah, no, thank thank you very much, um Alessio. Um I'm certainly a master class in governance, right? Um, I, Andrew, I'd, I'd love yeah. to bring you in because you're yeah, also I bring myself. Oh, ahead, <laughs> perfect. All right. <laughs> no, I no. I mean, make your contributions, and then I'll ask you the question that I wanted yeah. to ask around um, data standards. Sure. Yeah, because um, you know, Alicia, uh, Alicia laid it out right. What one of the questions that we get is 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 where should privacy fit, or where should um, this whole um, management of privacy and data protection sit? And it, my answer is always, it depends. It depends a lot on the size, on the maturity of the organization. Um, you know, we have seen where it, it resides in legal or um, some, some companies have legal and compliance, and it may reside there. But there may be some, some issues with that because, you know, depending on how the program is managed, you may have um, like a, a data protection officer where that officer reports and reside may be important because the officer has a responsibility to external stakeholders like the, the um, data subjects who are the people the data is about. Then you have, um, you know, some persons say it should fit in, in, in cyber security, but that may be only managing one aspect of it, the protection of the data, right? So it all depends, and it, what will happen is that it will bring together, you know, different teams and, and everything else. But the, the maturity of the organization will, you know, pretty much dictate sometimes where this lies. A lot of more mature organization will have an entire um, department or, or or section that is dedicated to data governance, right? The, the, the challenge with that sometimes is that the, the, the data governance team is looking at to what extent can we monetize data? 
And if we're monetizing data, they have to be aware that in monetizing data, they can violate the rights and freedoms of the data subjects. Okay. So they have to do so and, all, uh, and, and, and do so responsibly. So there's a lot that goes into determining for your specific organization, where should we place this and what other controls should we have in place to ensure that it works the way that it is intended, that we remain compliant, but strike that balance between compliance and be able to, to operate our business effectively. And so the, 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 sure. the answer to your question, Andre, is it depends. Yeah. And if I could jump in back, um, Jerry, in, in, on something that I'm kind of interested in, and look for the balance a little bit of, I'm interested in how we can build it But in, in organizations, as, as Andrew was alluding to, that have very mature um, data management practices, there's more like a unit that's responsible for that, and that's, that's, that's typically a good rest in peace. And while there is some argument around that, that conflict, you know, um, and being incentivized to, to, to monetize the data, they actually act as a first line activity. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in monetizing data, the key control to ensure that I'm not violating privacy practices was also the implementing. So the fact that I'm motivated to monetize also means that part of my care or part of the things that I'm also responsible for is in monetizing that data and not breaching regulations like privacy. So I think there is it's I think there is a way way for us as an industry then when you merge both of them, you don't keep it separate and create this disconnect, but you ensure that the person responsible has both sides of the responsibility. One the monetization and two the responsible use of data. Uh, and, and I'm glad you touched on that, um, Alicia, because I kind of wanted to go to um, the idea of transparency. Um, and from, from the perspective of transparency, how does that feed into an audit process that helps to protect the organization um, just by having that built into the governance uh, program? You want me to respond to that specifically? Yeah, you? yeah, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> sure, okay. right, but just so that we start to see the go governance as an important function as part of the data protection life cycle. Okay, absolutely. So in, 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 a, in a simple sense, governance is what ensures that we can consistently get optimum results um, from, from, from our processes. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a, a quick comment in, in, in the chat and I'll, I'll probably see the opportunity to address it. So we, 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 we like to speak about traditionally around the three lines of the fence. One is with the front line where the activity is being actively performed. Um, they also have a part of the responsibility ensuring that um, they're compliant. The second line of the fence is, of course, our compliance. Um, and of course, the third line is your, your strict independent um, internal auditors. Um, the, the data privacy officer, so jurisdiction and data protection officer, is typically seen as a compliance role, which is where we step on the line of defense, which means they are compromising their activity involved in frontline activities, but they can guide the operations. They're supposed to be experts, they're supposed to be able to bring skill sets to the organization to guide what is being done. Governance is important to ensure that. All those rules and responsibilities are clearly understood, um, particularly as we're in a new phase right now in terms of it being rolled out that your frontline person and people in your, your data management functions, um, your IT person who typically act as our key customers, um, your customer service representatives, your marketing people, <laughs> your sales people, perhaps are responsible to but creating the mass communication that they're very clear in terms of the lines that we should not cross. That somebody's responsible for configuring them, not configuring, for training them. Yes, that's an important thing to do, but for training all our, 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 our person in terms of what is acceptable. Then there are persons who ensure that that program runs and it delivers the results that we want. And then there's independent assessment. So I think so. To say it clearly, if you can remember those three lines, then I think it's a, it's a simple way of understanding how governance must be implemented such that it is not something that's done on the side, 
but it's something that's incorporated and embedded in our day-to-day -day practice but that we have sufficient work oversight and to independent assurance that what we're doing is adequate. Great, thank you. Um, and just to kind of segue into, I guess, the second point that you, you made, Alice, I'll bring Andrew in to answer a question that Shireen asked. Um, and it, the question is, can the data protection officer, can the DPO be the compliance officer as we are more leading towards separate function? So I know Alicia kind of touched on it a little bit, but Andrew, I kind of wanted to, to have your perspective as well. Can I say, can I, say I don't know? <laughs> no, you cannot. <laughs> I am not kept. I am removing the right way to say you don't know. <laughs> um, there, you, when there is a, for, for a lot of companies that we have seen, there is a tight line between, um, between legal and compliance, which is why I'm, I'm hesitating to answer the, the compliance question because for most of the companies that we have seen, you know, legal and compliance is one team. And what happens when um, a, a data subject um, brings a complaint against the data controller, what happens in that case is that the legal or compliance officer has an obligation to the organization first. The DPO has an obligation to the data subject and to the Office of the Information Commissioner whilst advising their clients. So there can be some conflict in terms of how that is managed. Now, if a compliance role is, is set up such that it is, it is, it is totally separate and um, it is not just looking at, depending on the reporting lines, you know, it may have a situation where you have a, a um, functional um, responsibility, a functional line to, to one party, right? And you have administratively, you report into another party. Um, so you may report administratively to the legal team or the head of legal, right? But functionally, you may report to an independent, like an like a audit committee or a committee of the board or a governance committee or something. Um, you know, in those cases, you, it, you may be able to fit. Again, it comes back to the size and maturity of your organization. This law is not set out to... to to tell you that you need to go out and hire a whole bunch of people and have this hierarchy or, um, that, that, that needs to be put in place. And, you know, because these are expensive resources that we're talking about. This, it is, you have to look at what your organization is doing, the objectives of your organization, understanding um, and unmasking the, 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 the things that you need to do and to see how you can put in the various um, controls the lines of demarcation through policies and processes um, to, to, to ensure that, that um, those lines are maintained. And if something happens, you know, how, if there is any kind of conflict that arises, how do you resolve that conflict? So it's trying to meet people where they are and not telling you that you need to do this or you need to do that, or you need to go out and you need to hire a whole legal and compliance team. It is, look at what we have and let us try to see um, how best it is and what other um, controls and gates that we need to put in to ensure that um, we maintain the, the, the necessary independence when that comes um, comes into play. Um, thank, thank you for that response, Andrew. And before I jump, there's a question um, around how the Jamaica Data Protection Act will affect um, the way that organizations interact with customers. And I'd love to, to ask Grace to, to respond to that. But before I do, Andrew, um, when we come across organizations that have the legal risk and compliance functions as all being separate entities, someone is asking in the chat, how does that, um, how does that kind of dynamic and relationship work as part of a full compliance journey? A lot of that comes to to how they how they work together. There are advantages to having things separate like that, right? Um, you know, but a lot comes to um, comes down to how these departments um, work together. From the legal perspective, the legal persons can interpret the law. They can defend the organization um, against um, different different um, um, claims and things like that, right? But if they, under, if, they, if, if they are working closely with the risk team, 
then the risk team would be able to, to identify all different types of risk, including privacy risk, and would be able to put in the necessary controls to mitigate the risk, whether it be transferring the risk, reducing the risk. Um, you know, some persons choose to ignore the risk because the reward is much greater than, than um, what the, 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 the consequences of the risk being realized. Um, you know, some persons choose to do that. So having risk in the mix, they help to inform um, legal and have legal prepare for what, th what they have not um, put in controls for. Um, having compliance, compliance is looking in the organization and ensuring that these things, the controls are working effectively. And that again, um, would advise the, the, the various teams. And, you know, so in having that close relationship between them, it, it um, helps to form for better protection of the organization, but it also helps um, in terms of compliance. And then legal also advice from, from the external landscape being, being, um, being conversant with all the other factors that may impact. So from the risk and compliance and the data privacy side, we may have a very um, narrow view of what is out there. We're looking at this particular law um, that we have to put in place. But as Jason and Grace, um, Grace mentioned, that there are several other laws that may impact this. And Grace mentioned um, NERA and, and NIDS. There's the Electronic Transactions Act. There's the, the Cyber Crimes um, Act in Jamaica. Um, there are several other um, laws that, that, that would come into play. And legal having a full um, view of the, 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 the re regulatory landscape, compliance having some of that view, they will be able to work together to form um, a, a great team. If they are siloed, then the organization may be in for some challenges because there would be gaps in those silos. Great, thank, thank you, Andrew. Um, I hope that that's adequately responded to the, that question that we got in the chat. Um, another one, um, this is for Grace, and I suspect um, this is going to be quite interesting for, for a number of you. Um, as a marketer, how will the Jamaica Data Protection Act affect the way in which I interact with potential and existing customers? All right. Excellent question. And let me just um, stop here to say that my whole view and the trajectory of my presentations, especially in Jamaica, has changed within the last year or so because I realized that Initially, people thought that data protection meant that you, you know, you had to use your data for the reason for which you collected it, which may be true in some circumstances, and that there would be no further direct marketing, all this search engine optimization and direct marketing and ad marketing online was out of the window with data protection laws. That is not the case. And that's another reason why I like the, the entire, you know, um, topic for today, unmasking privacy, un unmasking the monster, because there's no reason for us to be scared about data. This is not a law which has come in place for you to say, okay, well, keep your data, don't share it with anyone, stick up in there, and don't use it for any other purposes. Don't use it to build your own business, which is ridiculous in this age, you know? That's the whole reason why we're gathering data. We're trying to map um, trends from our customers and from our businesses, but we must do so responsibly. With the uh, insight that we have, we need to also be um, knowledgeable about the rights of the data subject, the right that they have not to have it being further processed, the right to even ask you about where, how their data is being used. So this is a rights-based piece of law, which is trying to balance their rights with your commercial um, you know, insights and your, your commercial demands and how can we balance that and create something which is fair to all parties? That's really what the law is about. So to get specific to the marketing issue, no. No. In fact, our laws uh, have been formulated in such a way to enable you to do some sort of direct marketing with consent. And there's some rules around that. If you sell a the same goods and services and you're selling your marketing to your customers about these goods and services, then you may have some leeway there, but you can't go to the client many times for you know, that sort of consent or, or contact them many times. There are some rules about it. And just know generally that this is not a law which prevents you from doing sort of direct marketing as a marketer, but you have to be responsible. 
Uh, you know, it's it's something which I hope we can all leave here with today, that this is not a law to prevent you from using data, but be responsible in how you do so. Thank, thank you so much, Grace. Um, Jason, love to bring you back in. Um, Grace touched on this idea of consent. And at the center of many of these pieces of legislation is, is that, that idea of consent. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that really means in practice and this idea of opting in or opting out and how organizations can operationalize that in a way that is not in conflict with the law? Yeah, so I, one of the things that I kind of want to back up a, a little bit on, and one of the things I think it's going to be curious to see how it plays out, uh, GDPR exists within a European context of rulings, uh, regulation, guidelines, uh, and other laws. And a lot of these GDPR-like uh, laws, like in, in Jamaica, Barbados, uh, et cetera, don't have that external context. They just have the, the regulation. And what, what I mean by this is, for instance, a lot of people, they look on uh, websites and they see these cookie banners. And the cookie banners are asking you to accept cookies and stuff like that. And there's an assumption that this is about GDPR. It's not. It's about e-privacy and the e-privacy directive uh, in the EU. And, and, and oftentimes the cookie banners will, will co-mingle inappropriately cookies from the e-privacy and asking for consent or even the right to object to legitimate interest processing under GDPR. And so, and so a lot of these cookie design, designers, in my view, frankly, get it wrong because they're not that they need to be lawyers, but they haven't looked at what are the actual requirements. So it, it's, it's a very confusing, uh, uh, you know, landscape to be, to be sure. Now, uh, uh, Andre, going back to your question about consent, I, I think this is, this is another kind of layman's assumption that a lot of GDPR is about consent. You have to get, you see it written in, in the popular press all the time. Oh, GDPR is about getting consent. Consent is actually kind of like the last legit, last lawful basis in which you should process. You should look to legitimate interest. You should look to contract. You should look to these other things first. And then if there's no other lawful basis for you to be processing, then maybe to go for consent. Consent should be, it, it should be actually a rarity. Uh, if you think about consent in like a medical context while you're consenting to a medical procedure, you have very lengthy forms about trying to inform you of the risk and, and make sure you understand what you're doing. Consent should not be kind of, you know, fly by night, these, you know, little tick boxes and stuff. Uh, it, it, it should be a, a rare event and kind of a, a last, a, a last resort, so to speak, uh, if you can't do anything else. Um, and frankly, consent is also a very tricky box uh, that most people, uh, you know, unless they are, are paying attention, uh, frankly, and in, in my humble opinion, get wrong. Uh, so, um, yeah. Great. Th th thank you for that perspective, um, Jason. I hadn't quite thought of of it like that, you know, consent being the last, the last resort. But yeah, certainly an interesting perspective. Um, we've been talking quite a bit about some of the legal components. We've spoken about some of the governance areas as well. Um, and I'd love to pivot the conversation a little bit to some of the technical considerations. Um, and Stuart, I'd, I'd love to to hear your perspective just around how organizations know whether their technical infrastructure is designed in a way that is compliant or that enables the organization to be compliant with some of the regulations. Thanks, Andre. And you know, to, to, answer, to answer this question, I actually want to take one quick step back to when we spoke about uh, who should own this privacy matter. And I, I, I say it because um, while Andrew said it depends, and it's completely right, it depends. Uh, there are some things that I want people to consider because I know there's a group of persons on this call that have to go back to their company and say, well, this is really who needs to lead it because we, we get calls from IT, HR, 
all these different departments saying my company said take this on and I have no idea where to start. Uh, and I just want to give you a couple of considerations with that because it is going to support the whole idea of implementation and managing your technical requirements is that um, from a global perspective and, and I give, and you know, for anybody who wants to write this down, uh, IAPP has a, a great resource uh, called the EY, the IAPP EY governance report and that gets published on an annual basis. And they actually do a survey of companies around the world to understand what they're, what they're doing to meet their privacy, uh, privacy and protection requirements. One of the things to answer that question is who, who, does, who does the privacy or protection function report to? And 41% of respondents out of 700 companies from 40 different countries say that it reports to legal. So to, to Grace's point, it's understandable why most people go to legal first. Um, but that being said, for a technical and implementation standpoint, oh, and just, just to give you some other insights, other teams in that group include, um, as Andrew mentioned, compliance, uh, is one of the top teams that take on this function as well as info security. But for organization, I'm sure there are many on this call that don't necessarily have a separation between IT and IT security. Uh, here's what you need to consider for, for making sure that you have the administrative controls in place. Do you have an adequate security governance framework in place? Start with that. Because while the legislation doesn't say that you have to have X, Y, Z at the moment and some of the regulations that are due to come out will give some more recommendations and basis. The idea is we need to understand that wherever our data is and whatever data we have, that is adequately protected. And while that term adequate is very ambiguous, the idea is if you're sitting in your organization and anybody across the company can access every customer data that you have in-house, you don't have adequate protection in place. You, you have to think about are there things that we know? And these are practices we know. You know somebody, if somebody walks into your house one day, you know not everybody should be able to walk into your personal bathroom for argument's sake. Um, you know, you, 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 you think about what you have and whether, that, and whether you're doing things to prevent the persons who should not have access to it or should not have the ability to use it. Do we have things in place to prevent that from happening? And one of the things that I recommend is you start with thinking about whether you have an adequate information security management system or framework in place. Um, so put together your team you know, in the implementation process and in, the, and in the determination of your level of adequacy to meet the legislation. While legal compliance, IT security or info security may be the teams that are leading this whole process, you put together a cross-functional team from your IT security, um, legal, compliance, regulatory management, risk, uh, customer service. In some companies, they have business intelligence or data analytics. Grab a few persons from those teams, put them together as a part of this implementation team. Ask the question, where does our data sit? Okay, based on that, what are we doing to prevent people from accessing it, both in its digital and physical form? Do we have procedures that require that if someone prints out um, a form with, with personal data on it, it doesn't sit on the printer for the next five days? Um, so those are the things that we have to think about in, term, in, in order to determine whether we have adequate controls. Now, what I do recommend is as best as possible, get a third, third, third party to validate it. And why a third party and not just your internal team is because you need an independent opinion. If you have a big enough team and you can create a sense of separation, you have an audit team with the skills, great. If you don't have that in place, you don't, and your audit team doesn't necessarily have the technical skills to do the measurements, Get a third party opinion because these are things that are going to help you to identify the vulnerabilities that exist uh, for somebody else to exploit. And you know, I, I, I say this you know, um, to, to, to Jason's point about there being you know, other legislations, um, FTC in the US actually find, actually find a CEO of a company named Drizzly, which is a tequila company or they are alcohol company and you know, sell some popular tequila. They find the CEO something like $210 million because the CEO was warned by the, by, by the Federal Trade Commission of a vulnerability that existed in their environment and the person did not address it. And that's, 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 a, that's proof that you know, this third party opinion, FTC is a third party, a regulatory body. They checked, they found this thing, they said, fix it. Then we're not, we're not giving you a big hard time because it's there. We're saying, fix it. Didn't address it. Well, I think it was two years. I can't remember the exact timeline. They didn't address it. 
And FTC said, well, you know, we're finding the company and we're finding the CEO because you had ultimate responsibility for making sure it happens. So get that third party to come and check your, your technical controls. If you have someone in place with the skills, by all means, use that person. Yeah, um, and, and that's a scary, um, I guess, this is the only part of the conversation that's scary, Andrew, right? You know, some of the implications, if you do not take the, the, the action to get the houses in order. Um, at the top of the conversation, Grace talked a little bit about data mapping. You know, when you go in to talk with a client, it's hard to even know what to tell them if you don't know what kind of data they have and where the data is. Um, so I'd love to kick it to Andrew a little bit, just to kind of expound on some of what Stuart said, right? Um, organizations tell us from time to time, I have so much data, so much information that resides in so many different places. I don't know where to begin. So talk to us a little bit about what a data discovery exercise is and how important this is as part of that technical compliance journey. All right, great. Thanks, Andre. Um, let me just um, take the opportunity to respond to um, our uh, pediatrician that talk, um, that's asking a question in the chat about paper files and everything. And I want to make this very clear that our law, the Jamaican laws talks about um, data in a filing system, and it didn't say a data in an electronic filing system, it says data in a filing system, which means that the paper files also um, come into play. All those cabinets that we have, you know, we may not be looking at um, technical controls, talking about user access control from the electronic um, or logical perspective, but we're talking about that from the physical perspective. Who has access? Do we have certain files under dual custody and things like that? You know, um, and the question is asked, um, you know, um, where are there any agencies that can be contacted to assist? And, um, you know, we have, we have three entities um, represented on, on, this, on this call. We have Carter Linda, we have uh, Simtai, and we have Enterprivacy that um, we, 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 we try as best as possible to work together to give each and every client the best solution that they have. And they have several other entities in Jamaica and internationally that can assist you along your, your, your journey. Um, from the, 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 the question you asked, um, Andre, is around you know, what other technical measures and could you repeat the, the, the other part? Because, you know, the brain doesn't. <laughs> it, it no, it was, it was really around the, the data discovery exercise. Right, data uh, discovery. Great. Right. Yeah, so it's knowing where your data resides, whether it be in paper files or otherwise, it's knowing where your data resides. And for some of us, we have, there, there are a lot of complexity in terms of that. So we collect data by paper forms. Those paper forms becomes important. Um, we collect data electronically through our website or when a customer sits in front of us, we type data into a system. That, that data is going to be transmitted throughout the system. Um, it may go to a, a server somewhere um, that, um, and that data may be filed in some uh, filing system, electronic filing system, or somebody may walk the paper to a vault or a cabinet, right? The, 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 server or system may reside in the cloud and that may reside in a jurisdiction. So when you're doing a data mapping um, exercise, it's really first and foremost, you want to identify the processes, all the processes that you have that use data, whatever type of data it is. Once you identify those processes and you look at you know, the method of collecting that, you distill that the, the, the information that is being collected and you look at the type of data that is being collected and you try to classify that data because there are special treatment for different types of data. There's special treatment for, 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 for data that is considered um, sensitive personal data. There's special treatment for data that's, that's, that's for children. In some legislation, maybe um, persons under 13 years, in our legislation is anyone under the age of 18 years are considered children. So there are special handling for those. So you, once you understand those processes, you, 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 want to, you want to look at all the different pieces of data that we have, we want to classify them. After classification, we want to know how that, how that data goes through our organization, whether through manual forms or electronically. So you want to do um, a data flow, right? And the data flow really takes the data from its point of origination right to the point of storage and possibly destruction. 
you have to bear in mind, you know, um, because that will help you to determine retention and, and all of these. So you know you know where the data is um, through that data flow, and it may be residing on a server in Jamaica, or it may be residing on a server you don't know where. And you have to find out where, because one of our um, uh, one of the standards um, talks about no transfer of data outside of a jurisdiction unless that jurisdiction um, protects the rights and freedoms of individuals of data subjects, right? So we have to understand where that resides. If it resides in a country that does not protect the rights and freedoms, or even if it resi resides in the in the United States that does not necessarily have a federal law that protects the rights and freedoms, you know, you, you have to now look at which state this is in. And based on that, you can know what you have. You can know where it resides. Now there's data that we, 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 we you know, that, you know, when you talk about a system, you may be looking at structured data, but you have data that you pass through like your email systems on a day-to-day -day basis. And some persons will say, we don't transfer data, but we're using a cloud service provider. We're using Microsoft um, Office 365. Um, we're using um, Google. Um, we're using different ways of storing our data. And you know, we are passing that data back and forth. We're passing that data through our email, our local email client. We're passing data um, through spreadsheets um, you know, between our different organizations, bet between our different um, team members. We're passing that data. So a wealth of data is residing in your organization. And that, and that data mapping exercise, Andre, um, is, is designed to find out where your data is and to determine um, what data, um, you know, to, 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 to classify that data so that you can start taking the appropriate actions, putting in the appropriate controls or know what you're up against in terms of putting in controls to protect not just the data. Remember, this um, protection laws is talking about the protection of the data about people with the view of protecting the people that the data is about, right? And that's where the protection comes in. So, you know, um, you know, we're, Jason and us, we had a conversation about the privacy versus the protection because the two are used interchangeably um, for most of us, but that can send the wrong signal. I'd allow Jason to, 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 to talk a little bit about that. But I hope that answers the question you're asking. I hope that makes it a little bit, you know, clearer for, for, for the, 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 the participants in this webinar. It does, but, but in answering the question, it also raises another question, right? Um, which is, so, so in the data mapping process or that data discovery exercise, you may realize that you have data that resides outside of your primary jurisdiction of operations. So in, in those cases, and perhaps Grace um, can, can jump in um, and, and Jason, what are some of the considerations when you do realize that one, you either have to transfer data outside of the primary jurisdiction of operations, or two, when you do realize that a lot, a lot of your data resides um, with other entities outside of, of your organization? Yeah, I, I just want to add a, a little uh, context to that and, and, and actually mention something else. One of the things that often is not thought about, so you think about the data you give to come to say processors or data they give to you, but the, the view from GDPR, and I'm assuming uh, the Data Protection Act in Jamaica as well, is if you are the controller, if you are telling somebody else to go collect data on your behalf, even if you're not holding it and they are processing it and doing something with it, say like employee relocation or you know doing something with your employees you are still the controller and you are obligated even though you never had the data you'll never get the data but you have to be mindful of data that you are you, that you have the say over now i i want to take a step back for something just was said a minute ago in, in the answer to one of the questions is don't freak out if you are a small company, a florist, or, or, or even a mid-sized company, react in scale. You don't need to hire a million data privacy officers, protection officers, et cetera. You know, if you have paper cabinets, just 
start to be mindful of, of what some of your obligations are, keeping the cabinet locked. If somebody asks for their data, responding. Again, don't think that this is necessarily overwhelming. It needs to scale appropriately. Sorry, I'll turn it over to Grace now to, to re-answer your question. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so when we do have instances where data is stored overseas, yes, the first question is, as Jason has said, are you still the controller or are you the controller at all? And once you answer that question in the affirmative or not, then various action um, steps are then required on your part, as especially as the controller. And in most instances, what we look at is, yes, the law is overseas, and you don't necessarily want to get an opinion from a lawyer, but in some instances, it may be necessary if there are sensitive data involved, for instance, if it's a large data set that is being transferred overseas. And what you do want to get from that opinion or from that assessment is what we call a transfer impact assessment at times which just says, well, in this jurisdiction, in jurisdiction X or Y, can the government come or any other regulator, any other third party come and take um, possession of this data that is really mine? What are the risks? It's a risk assessment which you have to do um, in respect of this third country to which you are transferring the data. And as Andrew said, what our laws require are that if you're transferring data outside of your home jurisdiction, outside of Jamaica, then you have to do some due diligence because there has to be some equivalence in the laws. We don't need it to be similar, but we need to make sure that the Jamaican citizen or the Jamaican data subjects are not being put at a disadvantage. Uh, and agreed with, with Jason in respect of how GDPR is treated. Uh, in fact, I should have you know, touched on this earlier. Because our law is very EU-based, it's common law, it's coming out of the UK, um, coming out of Europe, we do have quite a few guidelines um, coming out of the European Data Protection Board and a predecessor to that, which is called the Article 29 Working Group. And those are persuasive on us here in the Caribbean to a bit. So we do have quite a few guidelines at home to interpret the laws here in Jamaica. So yes, it's very new. Uh, and you know, and, and we're not starting from a starting point of zero. We do have quite a bit of both case law and regulatory guidelines, which we think would be very persuasive on our information commissioner, and certainly if a matter goes to court. But outside of a transfer impact assessment, just to make the point that if you have existing contracts with overseas cloud service providers or with other entities which hold your data, now is the time perhaps to look at that. Again, it's a risk assessment project that you're about to undertake and see whether they appropriately cover you, not only in terms of access, but it, certainly in terms of breach notification. And we haven't touched on that yet today, but there are timelines, for instance, in respect of how soon after a breach you have to inform or commission a locally about that breach having taken place. And if you don't hold the data in your systems, you need to make sure that the persons who do also are contacting you as soon as a breach occurs and that there's some line of communication in respect of not only breaches, but anything else, change in laws, for instance, that may be applicable to your data and to your data set, and to your data subjects data. Uh, so it does require a bit more of responsibility on our part as Jamaican controllers going forward. Awesome. Um, you touched on so many things. And in fact, you segued into a question that someone asked in the chat um, that I wanted your um, your take on. The question is, will companies be required to review or amend, this is from Ray Palmer, review or amend all contracts with third parties who have access to the company's client data? I saw that question. So think... And the answer is, I would, to reduce the risk to the organization, I would start on that journey now. Uh, you know, several of our more historical contracts 15, 20 years ago did not speak to data, unfortunately, and it wouldn't have because it's such a not new concept, but something which has become more, you know, immediate in the last five to 10 years or so. And so there is no discussion in those um, contracts about the treatment of data, you know, again, reporting any issues which may arise if there's a breach, etc. So start to look at your contractual documents and there's nothing wrong in you coming to your um, contractual party and asking for an addendum, um, which we normally call the data processing agreement to fill those gaps which need to be filled so that you become compliant with Jamaican laws. But I, I'd, like okay. to add to that. I'd like to add something to that. Uh, so going back to my comment about scale, you know, in an ideal world, yes, you'd wanna review all of your vendor agreements and contracts, make sure they're in place and got all their I's dotted and T's crossed. But you, know, you, you, have, to, you have to take a risk-based approach 
if you are a pediatrician's office and you have a company that's doing something storing health data, maybe that's a contract you should look at. If you have a janitorial service is coming in and cleaning your office every day, you know, maybe that's at the end of the line. If you have something doing payroll, maybe that's somewhere in the middle of you'll get to, but not, you know, an immediate need. So again, take a, you know, take a, a measured approach. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, and in talking about um, borderless storage, and I just love to use this opportunity to respond to a couple of questions that we, we have in the chat. Um, in the Q&A um, section. So one question from Tamika Kong, how secure is the cloud system when storing data? Um, Andrew, you want to take this one? Um, yeah, you know, I, I hear a lot of questions about that, right? You know, how secure is cloud? Well, the cloud is as secure as you make it, right? A lot of persons figure more or less by purchasing a cloud service and storing your data there, everything is taken care of. Just to, to, to unmask cloud a little bit, you know, cloud really is a remote data center. And that remote data center may, may sell you a server or a shared space on a server, or it may sell you a platform, or it may sell you an application that you can use. There are different types of cloud services, right? But the responsibility to ensure that you, the data that you store there or, or the platform that you use is secure still resides with you. It may start at the first point um, in terms of searching for a cloud provider. Look at what they're providing to you. They may be providing a remote box and you decide that because it's cloud, you're going to just put everything on that remote box and it has nothing else around it. It may very well um, mean that the, the, the contract, the, the service that you're getting is expecting you to do all of these things. So it's a look at your contract to ensure that you have someone with the technical know-how, technical knowledge, to balance what you need with what the provider is offering and someone who can look at the, 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 the different exposures that you may have. It's a part of the due diligence. Um, Jason will refer to that part of the due diligence as a risk assessment. You know, what is it that I'm gaining? What is it that I'm giving up? What is it that a cloud provider says that they're they are, they are providing? What is it that I want? What is it that I need to do to ensure that it's protected? So having it cloud doesn't necessarily mean that it's automatically um, protected. It means that you have a remote facility that you can use. The onus is on you to ensure that it is protected through contracts, through technical means, through validations to steward point, having uh, someone validate whether or not this is meeting the needs of both your um, processes and what the law um, and the legal framework uh, may require. Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, and just staying with you, there is another question in the chat um, from Milton. Um, the question is for entities that currently utilize cloud platforms, what exists in the act to protect this data? Uh, or, or I guess the question is, is there anything in the act that speaks to how cl cloud platforms are treated? Well, well, I mean, there's nothing in the act that protects the data. The act itself is trying to protect the, the individuals who the data is about, and it, it is, it, talks about you know um, the, the the standards or principles or Jason would put it the privacy by design um, components because those standards and principles and, and and all of that is really telling you to to approach things with um, privacy by design so it tells you what you you ought to be doing to protect the data regardless of where the data is is is, is stored or collected or you know you want to protect that data throughout its life cycle. And if you follow the principles of the act, then you'll be, you'll, you will um, start by, um, that will go a far way in helping to protect. Um, and, and I don't know if Jason wants to chime in with, with the whole privacy by design concept uh, in terms of that. Well, I, I, so th thanks Andrew. I, I think it's an important question in that the, the way I've seen some of these questions about protecting the data, right? That to me, you know, leads me to think that most people are still thinking this is about securing data, keeping it secure, keeping it confidential, et cetera. And as you mentioned, the, the, the act is about protecting people through their data by giving them, giving them choices, uh, giving them a right to, you know, understand and limiting the uses 
for particular purposes, um, not necessarily about the confidentiality and the security of data. So, so I, I want to impart on everybody in the audience that data protection is not about protecting data. It is about protecting people through their data. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much for making that distinction. Um, I think it's quite an important one. Um, and if Jason. I could just jump yep. in, and, Ali. Uh, Andre, um, going, going back to Andrew's um, responses and, and the question that's been asked, um, the what needs to be done will depend also on the, the type of cloud service that you're consuming, mm -hmm. the infrastructure as a service, platform as a service software as a service, if it changes the dynamic of the relationship between yourself and the vendor. But just a quick look at their standards that have been published. There's 27,017 and 18 that helps to kind of guide us in terms of, all right, we had 27,000 and one and two. This is what it looks like now for, for when you're entering into a cloud relationship. So there's still a lot of material out there to help us navigate this new space that makes it more exciting than scary. So that's 27,017 and 18 good standards that are in, in your back pocket in terms of how to navigate the cloud space, even as you consider things around security, the massive protection, and of course, unlocking all of that with, with privacy, protecting the individual. Um, as we Great, thank you so much for that, um, Ali. Um, I am conscious that we are, we just have a little over five minutes to go. Um, we'd love to throw another poll question up um, just to get a sense of where your organization currently is on the data protection and implementation uh, compliance journey. Um, so the question reads, where is your organization on the data protection compliance journey? Um, you've not started. You are well advanced on that journey. Um, you are you consider yourself to be compliant, or you simply just don't know. While you're responding to to um, to that question, to that poll question, I'd love to bring Stuart back into the conversation. Um, so, Stuart, you've been you've been working with a lot of clients who are looking at implementing, um, you know, some form of data protection program. What would you say have been some of the main pain points for these clients and what strategies do you find to be most effective in kickstarting that compliance journey? Thanks for that, Andre. Um, you know, one of the main pain points coming right back to one of our earlier questions is ownership. Um, you know, the first question people ask is who really needs to lead this effort? Um, and you're going to have that with any program. And I, I liken the privacy program journey to that of your business continuity. Persons hear certain technical terms, they throw it on IT. IT has a hard time figuring it out because this is something that's beyond just their realm. Um, but it's a combinational effort. So start with start with making sure to define an owner. And as Andrew said, it depends on your organization because your the makeup of your organization is going to vary. Large organizations have more persons that they can potentially assign. Small organizations may have one person who sits with 15 different hats. Um, but you know, start with putting together a cross-functional team of persons who should understand and know where data is. Uh, another pain point is similar to what Andrew was explaining around the data discovery piece. A lot of persons say, we collect data, but I don't know where it is. I don't know what data we do have, and I don't know what are some of the requirements around it, such as how long do we need to retain it? Uh, one important aspect of that is, of course, getting the legal advice to understand some of your legal requirements for how long you should retain data, and, and getting an opinion, a legal opinion, and do you have the lawful basis for collecting and processing this data? As Jason said, consent should be the last thing you go to. But that being said, you can't throw legitimate interest on everything else. Um, you should be able to you know, get, a, get a good legal opinion as to whether this is a contractual basis. Is this re is, does legitimate interest actually fit this scenario? Um, so so you know, get that legal person on your team to help advise. Uh, formulate the teams and split up the work. Don't treat data discovery, mapping, and your program implementation as it's only the owner who has to deal with this. One approach that I advise teams on when doing your data discovery is split the work amongst the teams who need data. So you may put up, you, you know, if you've developed the form and you've provided a standard for collecting and understanding what data you have in place, give that form to your customer service team, give that form to IT, Give that form, give that form over to, to uh, marketing and say, fill it out. 
tell us exactly what you need to do. So, you know, one person doesn't become overburdened with the responsibility of having to do everything. But the, what the owner will do is compile everything and, and, and double check, you know, give the assurance that we're meeting a quality standard across the board. And of course, get that legal advice to, to help you with determining are these things making sense? Um, are there some things, you know, somebody who can ask the question, do we really need to collect this data anymore? And do we need to process it? Um, can we find a, a way to know, uh, remove it? So, you know, there are tons of other things I could say, but I, I say Andrew on me, so I'll, I'll let him add in on that. No, I, I, I just um, saw we recovered um, a couple of, of, of the, the lawful basis of processing. You spoke of consent, which we've all been talking about. You spoke of contractual obligation. There's also um, public interest, um, which is, you know, we saw that playing out in the pandemic where health information may have to be processed in the, in the interest of public good. There's vital interest where you may be able to process data for an individual you would not otherwise be processing um, if the individual is in a critical um, position and cannot respond or cannot give you authorization, then you may. So you may have somebody who has fainted on the job and you don't know if this is an allergic reaction to something or something else. You may have to go con consult their the, the, the HR records. Um, Stuart already mentioned legitimate interest and I always miss one of the six that our, our law re recommends. Um, legal basis. If there is a um, uh, uh, any kind of a uh, um, law enforcement things involved, law enforcement may require that um, certain data going through the proper channels of warrants and all of that um, data be, be, be processed. So those are some of the things to look. And again, I will reiterate, everybody's talking consent, consent, consent. Just remember, consent can be withdrawn as easily as it has been given. So you can get the consent today and then tomorrow the person calls and say, hey, I, 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 I no longer consent to this. And you have to give them that option as a part of their rights. Great, thank you, Andrew. Me. We're almost out of time, but there are two really important questions in the chat that I'd love for us to get to. So I'm asking for your indulgence for just another couple of minutes. Um, well, I'll ask the second one first, which is, and this is directed to either Andrew or Grace, if there is a data breach that you are unaware of and the third party reports it to the commissioner, rather than your organization, is there a greater penalty attached to this? And this mm -hmm. is from Taishan Tracy. Yeah. That's, um, that's a very good question because the entire, the provisions around reporting is, you know, you have to report it as soon as you are aware. Um, but we as lawyers know that knowledge, and the, word, the statute uses knowledge, knowledge comes in many forms, you know, constructive knowledge, actual knowledge, etc. So you'd have to look and see how that is interpreted. I do think um, if you didn't have knowledge and it was your fault, you can ask for, you know, mitigation to an extent. But what we must keep in mind is that there is a, an upper limit in respect of um, fines which can be imposed and it is your duty to show mitigating circumstances as a controller so who's to know you know what would be taken in to consideration by the information commissioner but keep in mind that those mitigating circumstances are there for your use if so great thank you thank you grace um and this this other one came in um if I'm in Jamaica. If my company hasn't started any preparation for the deadline, is it too late? And where do I start? Um, Ali, I see Stuart nodding, shaking his head. Um, Stuart, you want to tackle that one? Ali, Andrew, um, you can also jump in too. The short answer, of course, is it's not too late. Um, you have until November 30th to register. There are some more. There is some more information at this coming hotel support, but um, the important thing is to start and to start immediately. Understand what are the key things that you need to submit. So there are going to be some things about your program that go beyond the registration deadline, and that's fine. But the key is make sure you have what you need to register in place, which is your data inventory, contact information about your organization, contact information about your data protection officer, if required. I won't get into all the details around that. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's it. The data inventory, though, has multiple parts to it. So, you know, if you look at the legislation, Section 16 speaks to what are those items that should be required. And then, of course, be ready to submit your data protection impact assessment within 30 days 
of the end of the calendar year. So by March, you're ready to submit that. So focus on what you need to register, put together the team, get started. And the team, of course, must be cross-functional. Uh, wherever data is touched, put those persons together because your data inventory is going to require quite a bit of effort from multiple persons. Um, other than that, call us, anyone on this call, uh, anyone on, on this, on this, on this um, panel to, of course, help you get started um, on that journey. Yeah. One of the challenges, I mean, though it's not too late to start, one of the challenges that, that um, organizations will face is that the skill set, if you're seeking external assistance, the skill sets, this being a five to 10 year old focus on data privacy, the skill set across the globe is also limited. And what you'll find is that there's a lot of competition to get those scarce resources to assist you on your program. So you have to bear that in mind in coming to a decision, you know, don't wait until the last minute to do so, but start reaching out to your preferred um, providers to, to, to assist you along uh, your journey. But no, it's, it's not too late, but don't wait until it is. Great, People thank you, Andrew. Time, but yeah, I, I am, yeah, we are a little sorry. Go ahead, Alicia. No, I, I just want to bring back on time, which I like to finish with chances. The importance of the reacting scheme. If, if you're a multinational huge company trying to do this today, you really put very few behind the bar. But you know, even in that scenario, look at what is absolutely important to get done. And chances are professional can craft something that gets the, the, the key things done in time for you to meet that November time. Great. Yeah, that, and that's an important point and a great takeaway too from um, a point that Jason shared earlier. I will ask each of you, maybe in um, you know a sentence or two, just to leave some parting words with all of the attendees. We still have close to 300 people on and the fact that they've stayed on, even though we've gone a little bit over time, says to me that you're finding the dialogue quite interesting and informative. But before I invite each of you to share your last two cents, um, I just want to bring your attention to a couple of things. You Somebody asked about, you know, where do I start? We haven't started anything just yet. Um, there are a couple of things that, you know, Simtai offers. Um, there is a Jamaica Data Protection Act short course that we're offering, and it is um, almost a crash course around everything GDPA, GDPA related. Um, and it looks at data protection a little bit more broadly too. Um, so, you know, I'll give you a little bit more detail about that. Um, we offer executive briefing. So if you want to start from an, an awareness and sensitization perspective, we are able to come into your organization, either physically or um, virtually, um, and do a sensitization session, either for your leadership team or for, the, for your entire organization. These sessions generally tend to um, run from anywhere from one hour to, um, to three hours. Um, and then there are, um, you know, things like the gap assessment, for example, and that provides a clear understanding of gaps between the organization's current state, where you are today, um, and where you need to be in order to be considered fully compliant with the Act. Um, and what's not on this slide is the data privacy um, training courses, the certified training courses that we offer in collaboration through the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Speaking about the uh, JDPA, for all of the attendees on, uh, on this webinar today, there is a special offer. You can get access for up to 30 days to the JDPA short course, completely free of, of, of charge. All you need to do to qualify is to send an email to training at simtai.com expressing an interest in the JDPA course. Um, the email used must be the same as the one used to register, that you registered for the web, webinar. And the first 10 names received will be given access to the course for, well, this says 90 days, but really it is it is um, 10 and limited to one ticket per, per participant. So I hope that is clear. Um, as we wrap up the, the, this conversation, when, when we just started, I was thinking, well, 90 minutes seems like such a long time. But there are so many other elements that we haven't touched on and so many other things that we, we really um, could go into. Um, but, but I'll invite each of the panelists just to leave a parting thought or word with the participants when they contemplate tackling this monster of data protection. Um, where do they begin? What do they tackle first? What should they consider as most important? 
any kind of approach that they may need to take. Let's start with, with um, Jason. Thank you very much. And again, thank you very much for, for having me here. Um, if you're a fan of, of, of Douglas Adams, the author, I would say don't panic. Uh, if you're more a fan of, uh, of British history, uh, keep calm, carry on. Uh, it, what I would say is, uh, again, don't, don't freak out, don't panic. Uh, just start your process. That, you know, begin and think of like, what is the systematic approach that I'm going to take to address uh, this, this legislation? And uh, just, you know, every journey starts with the first step. You just got to start take that first step. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Stuart. Yeah, I, I, I did. I did tell Jason in every way. Uh, just get started. Uh, don't you know, as Ali said, if you are a large multinational, then you may be a little bit behind the ball. If you're a small organization and have a good grasp of what, what is there, then you, you, you have adequate time. But the point is to get started. And, and getting started could mean that you brought in an external team. It could mean that you mobilize internal resources. Uh, but of course, the effort is going to be dependent on how much you can leverage already and how available your personnel are to really get the ball rolling. You haven't started at all. You're a large multinational. You have a lot of work to do. You may have to tell you know, a few team members to drop everything else and focus on this for the next few months. If, if you're not, then you may be able to leverage some existing personnel to say, hey, you know, um, cut back on some of these activities, but you know, give some focus to putting together our data inventory, modifying our policies, understanding where our data is, um, you know, putting things in place that can now enable us to meet our requirements, such as responding the data subject request. But again, the idea is get started. Don't put it, don't put it on the back burner to next year because we do need to get registered in 2023. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stuart. Um, Alicia, then Grace, and then Andrew will close out the, the panel. Sure. Thank you so much, Andrew. And it was really great hanging with, with everyone today. Uh, from this. I detail everything from the other presenters and I'll add to you three things. One, Educate yourself. Privacy is an extremely um, interesting topic. If you take a step back and just kind of acquaint yourself with the history behind it, why it is so important, and you, you realize that it's really intended to protect us as individuals. And when you appreciate the why behind the legislation, it becomes a really exciting exercise to ensure that you can extend this to your customers, to your staff. There's a soft part to this legislation that I think is is so key that makes the journey not just less scary, but you become an advocate for why the legislation is in place versus you know, just trying to be compliant to this. I think this is, is very, very important. Secondly, there are tons of methodologies in place that has helped our friends in the North and even people within the region to become compliant. We have several clients so far on their journey to be in a more comfortable place that there's methods out there. And once you consistently follow those methodologies and you take and a big tagline from this section is, um, you know, we have to scale, um, tackle those things that are most likely to have the biggest impact to your organization. You can kind of bring this very nebulous thoughts and idea into something that is manageable, not just by you, but also by your team. And once you can understand it, then you can delegate and put structure around achieving the objectives um, with the main top three things. Thank you so much, Andre. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. All right. So I want to detail what Alex said as well in respect of thinking of this as a rights-based program, because that makes it, again, more enjoyable. Certainly, if you're, if you're a lawyer, you, you know, you like to enforce rights, you like to make sure that people's rights are respected as, as much as possible. But when you think about it as a rights-based program, it becomes a little less scary as well. It's not the monster that um, people make it out to be. At the same time, while we're respecting rights, we're carving out a path for you to continue your business um, using data in a responsible way with these rights at the back of your, your mind. And so things like data subject access requests, you know, you're going to have customers coming to you now to ask you, what data do you have on me? And if you're a government body, that may be easier for you because you may be used to an access to information sort of model. But in respect of data, we're going to see that being transferred into private rights, data rights. But don't be scared. 
Uh, think about how data is used in your various business centers, whether it is through human resources, whether it's in marketing, whether it's in customer facing aspects of your business and work from there. It can be something which can be very fulfilling for your, your customers when they see you respecting their rights. And that approach may be even more beneficial to your business in the long run. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. Andrew, you have the final word. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Andre. And, and thanks. It's, it's been my pleasure sitting with this team, um, you know, and to know that I work with this team on a on a day-to-day um, -day basis to bring the best of our knowledge together for um, to find solutions for, for our clients is, is great. Um, from, from my perspective, um, you know, for those large organizations that are that are um, are mature, we'll say utilize what you already know, right? So we have gone through a process of trying to break things down into a work stream, and we came up with project management, um, your technical team that helps you with your data discovery and mapping, your risk analysts that is going to help you with your privacy risk analysis, your solution selection team that if you need solutions to assist you along the journey, then you have a solution selection process, your legal and compliance team that are going to do that legitimate interest analysis or transfer impact analysis and contract reviews, they're going to help you with that. Utilize them, your training and awareness um, teams that are going to help you to, to get the information out and help you to, to identify champions of this process. Your change management team that's going to get this into the DNA, into your system. As, as the term says, privacy by design, getting that into your system. Above all else, remember that you're looking for a positive sum, not a zero sum. This is not a trade-off of privacy versus your business but finding that delicate balance that is going to make it a win-win. You get to conduct the legitimate interests of your business while respecting the rights and freedoms of people. Awesome, great way to end. Thank you so much um, for, for that, Andrew, and all the other panelists. Just a couple of things um, before, before we formally close, um, there, a, a number of questions came into the Q&A section and I've not been able to get to all of them. What we will commit to doing is to providing written responses to some of the questions or the ones that we didn't get to answer um, during this webinar and we'll send them out in a post webinar follow up email. Um, there will also be a, um, a, a feedback form that will be sent to you. We crave your indulgence. We definitely want to know whether or not you found this useful. Um, the fact that we still have over 250 people on, I suspect is a good indicator that you indeed found the conversation insightful and informative. Um, but nonetheless, we'd love for you to, con to complete the feedback survey. Um, and I think it might be useful just to also throw up the poll results on the screen as well um, so that you, we can see whether or not organizations feel as though they are sufficiently um, right. So a number of people have said 38% uh, said they have not started um, on the protection and compliance journey. 25%, um, I'm sorry, 31% said not started. 25% say that they're well advanced and 7% say that they're compliant. Um, and the vast majority, 37% say that they just don't know. Um, and again, you know, that, that's kind of why a company like Simta is, is here having this conversation to support you on, on that journey. So again, I thank you all for joining. I thank you for participating. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for being fully present. Thank you for interacting. Thank you to Stuart, to Alicia, to Grace, to Andrew, and to Jason. Um, it's been a pleasure having this conversation um, with you, and I bid you all a good rest of, of day. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Okay, thanks.